Christmas. It's Christmas season. Anyone excited for Christmas? Oh, the middle service, not, not so much. Anyone here, you love Christmas? Make some noise. Prove it. If Christmas is your favorite holiday, would you, would you raise your hand? All right, a lot of people, if Christmas is your favorite holiday, maybe you're like me and you think Thanksgiving is your favorite holiday, but Christmas, it surpasses that because it's food and family and gifts. But, but I, I want to I see if Christmas really is all of your favorite holidays. How many people in here, let's prove it, how many people in here, you have had your Christmas tree set up already? Let me see, by show of hands. Wow, more than half of the people in here? Okay, okay. Some Christmas fans here. Yay, Christmas! Okay, so those of you who think that you're Christmas fans, how many of you who already have your tree set up, you've had it set up from before Thanksgiving? Let me see by show of hands. Wow, so about half of those people. Here's the real litmus test. Okay, this is going to show who the real Christians are, the Christians of Christmas. How many of those people who you've had your Christmas tree set up from before Thanksgiving you also have a nativity set up in your home. Wow. So, so about like 10% of the people, give it up for the real Christians. <laughs> the people who really love Jesus. Because we know that's what Christmas is really about, right? Jesus is the reason for the season. It's not about your tree. It's about Jesus. Amen. You're like, oh, why are you beating this up? Listen, today we're kicking off a new uh, series of talks titled Merry and Bright. Because the Christmas season's all about being merry and having joy and seeing the light of the world. And, and what we're going to talk about over the next several weeks, weeks through the month of December is we're going to talk about the power that comes in the presence of God. He's, he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. What does that mean for us? And so today, as we set the tone, I know it's the Sunday after Thanksgiving. A lot of you, you're waking up late and you're not really all here. Some people, they're still out on vacation. But we're going to set the tone for the entire month today. We're going to set the tone for what God can do, what God wants to do this Christmas. Because a lot of us, we already think we know what Christmas is all about, right? I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them, you think you know. You think you know. And the reason we think we know is because every year in churches all across the globe, we talk about Christmas and we open up God's word that tells us the Christmas story. And so we, we read from and we think we know all about Christmas, but when we read the Christmas story, typically we focus on Matthew or we focus on Luke. And both those writers, they focus on the humanity of Jesus. They tell the Christmas story of how Jesus came as one of us and Jesus walked with us. And it's not a bad story, okay? It's not. It's the greatest story ever told. It's, it's a rescue story. It's a story about a hero. But when we read John's version of the Christmas story, he doesn't focus on the humanity. He focuses on the divinity in the first three verses of John's book, of John's Christmas story, he moves way past the natural and jumps right to the supernatural. He doesn't tell the origin story. See, it seems like every new superhero story, every iteration of a popular superhero, they go back and they tell the origin. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, how many Batmans have there been? And every single Batman reboot tells the poor story of little Bruce Wayne. And poor little Bruce Wayne, he leaves the movie theater with his parents, and what happens to them? You guys don't know the origin story? <laughs> they get shot. Oh, no. And now he becomes Batman. That's the fuel. That's his motivation. Poor little Bruce Wayne. Or what about every reboot of Superman? We know the story. Kal-El comes from the planet Krypton. He comes in this pod. They land in Kansas, and the pod opens up, and, and, and who pops out? A little baby in a diaper. Like, we, we hear these origin stories, and because we're so familiar with them, they lose their power. They lose the awe of, of why we share those stories. And John, John doesn't give us a slow burn. John doesn't tell us the origin. John, he, Spider-Man homecomings it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Did you watch that movie? 
They don't give the origin story. They don't tell us about Uncle Ben. They don't show the radioactive spider biting him. They jump right into the power of this person. That's what John does. For three years, he's understanding who Jesus is. And so he just moves past all of the natural, jumps right into the super. And in three verses, he summarizes everything over three years of his experience with Jesus. In John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Again, we're going to set the tone today. We're going to set the temperature for all that God is going to do this Christmas season. So if you see a word bolded and underlined, I want you to say that out loud. Can we do that 10 a.m.? Here's John's telling of the Christmas story. You think you know. Listen to this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was there in the beginning. And he cracks it a little bit more. Verse 2. He was with God in the beginning. Verse 3. Through him, through the word, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. I I want you to think about that. Everything that we're experiencing, everything that has been made, Jesus made. From the very beginning, Jesus was there. From the very beginning, Jesus is God. From the very beginning, Jesus is a creator. He created everything in the beginning. You ever watch the movie that gives you a twist at the end and you're like, whoa, I didn't see that. Then you rewatch the movie and now everything makes more sense because of that twist. This is what John's done to us. See, because if you go back to the very beginning, if you go back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it sounds very familiar. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless. It was empty. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. Listen, we're celebrating Christmas. We're lighting up everything. We're singing these carols. We have a smile on our face. But if a lot of us are honest, we don't feel merry or bright about this season. Maybe for some of us in here, we feel like life is formless. It's scattered. There's no order to it. Everything's just out of place. Maybe you're here and you feel empty or void. There is no joy. There is no celebration. In your heart, there is a void. And and you're searching for something more. Maybe for some of you, this season, as we celebrate Christmas, it's not a season of merry and bright. It's a season of darkness for you. You're hurt. You're you're remembering the past. You're remembering the pain that you felt. Verse 2, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. If, If that feels like you, void, shapeless, without form, darkness, just like the Spirit of God in the beginning was preparing to create life, the Spirit of God is here right now. And he's preparing to do something miraculous and marvelous in our lives to transform us. Verse 3, and then it says, and God said. This is huge. See, nine times in Genesis 1, we see that phrase repeated, and God said. God is reminding us nine times in the beginning that he didn't think creation into existence. He didn't wink, he didn't nod, he didn't use little hula hula fingers. God spoke everything into existence. Creation was formed out of his words. And like John told us, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word created everything. And God said, let there be Come on, 10 o'clock. You think that's how God said it? He's creating things. And God said, let there be Wow. And there was light. Creation started when Jesus spoke light. Some people say, well, that's the Big Bang. Big flash of light, Jesus spoke it. Listen, I'm not here to talk about how things were created, when it happened, for how long that it took. It says that Jesus said, let there be light, and there was light. And then we go back to John chapter 1, verse 4. It says, in him, the word was life, 
And that life was the light of all mankind. See, I'm not trying to answer the, the when and the how and the what about creation. I'm here to tell you the why. Because the why is far more important. Why did God create? Why did God send Jesus to give us light? Because he loves us. And because he wants to give us his light. He wants to give us his life. He wants to share with us his love. That's why all of this is in play. This is why we celebrate. Because Jesus loves you. And he wants you to experience the fullness of who he is and why he came. John 1, 5, it says the light shines in the what? Darkness. The darkness. But get this, the darkness has not overcome it. No matter how dark it may seem, no matter how dark it may feel, in the presence of light, dark has to go. Darkness cannot overcome the light of God. Darkness cannot overcome what Jesus has come for, what Jesus comes to bring. And then verse 9, it says, the true light, this is key, the true light that gives light to everyone. Jesus was coming into the world, and he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, though the word spoke everything into existence through light, the world did not recognize him. This is what I want us to understand about Christmas. This is why we're setting the tone. Do, do you know about Jesus? Do you know about the Christmas story, or, or do you actually know the Christ of Christmas? Big difference. Huge chasm in between. Do you know about Jesus, or do you really know him? One of my top 20 favorite movies of all time. I shared with you my, my favorite movie of all time was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Listen, so you're not going to be surprised that this is one of my top favorite movies as well. Uh, I want to share a little portion of it. Um, but I know it might seem a little bit offensive to some people. Don't be offended. There's so many things to be offended. Don't be offended here. It might seem a little irreverent. I have a point. But I want to share a little snippet from one of my favorite movies, Talladega Nights. The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. Uh, if you haven't watched the story, um, I'm not going to recommend it, but it's really good. And, and it tells a story of this NASCAR racer named Ricky Bobby. And there's this one scene where he's sitting with his family and he begins to pray. He's with his best friend Cal and they're over this dinner. And I just, I have a point, but I just want to read a little bit of this prayer. Ricky Bobby starts off by praying, saying, Dear Lord, baby Jesus, or as our brothers to the south call you, Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. I just want to take time to say thank you for my family, my two beautiful, beautiful, handsome, striking sons, Walker and Texas Ranger, or TR as we call him, and of course, my red-hot smoking wife, Carly, who is a stone-cold fox. Whoop, whoop. He continues on. Dear tiny infant Jesus, we, and then Carly jumps in. Hey, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him a baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting that you pray to a baby. And Ricky says, well, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus or whoever you want. Look, I like the baby version best. Do you hear me? Dear eight-pound, six-ounce, <laughs> newborn infant Jesus, don't even know a word yet, just a little infant, so cuddly but still omnipotent. Thank you for all your power and your grace, dear baby God. Amen. No, do not applaud for that. I come and I prepare and I pray my heart out and you applaud for Ricky Bobby? Really? See, a lot of you, you think it's funny. I actually find it familiar. So many of us, that's the Jesus we see. We see the tiny little eight-pound, six-ounce baby Jesus in a golden fleece diaper, and we never move beyond that to see who he really is, what he's come to do. And so as we talk through this Christmas season, we're setting the tone today. You want to know the reality about Jesus? He's not a little infant. He's not a pathetic little baby. He's creator God. He's the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords, and he's come to bring light. 
Oh, so you're not going to applaud that, but you're going <laughs> to. Here's the big idea I want us to get to say. R- write this down. Open up your app. Put it down in here. Here's the big idea I want all of us to get. And I want us to say it out loud. Put it up there on the screen. Let's say it together. Jesus is the light of the world. Turn to your neighbor. Tell him that. He's the light of the world. Some of you are like, I don't know what that means. It sounds so churchy. It sounds so Christianese. I I get it. Even saying it, even repeating it, it just sounds like something that we say on autopilot. We sing about Jesus being the light of the world. What does that even mean? Do, Do you know there's so much power when we understand that Jesus is the light? There's so much hope. There's so much life when we understand that Jesus is the light. There's so much depth in theology when we understand that Jesus didn't just bring the light. Jesus is the light. Well, what does that mean? I still don't get it. I want to make this as practical as possible. John didn't speak in lofty language that makes it hard for us to grasp. John spoke so we can understand who Jesus is and the power that he brings when he comes to be with us. And so I want to explain this as simple as possible. I want to ask a question. What does light do? Light helps us to see. Do you know without light, we are hopelessly blind? Blind to ourselves, blind to our surroundings. Without light, we can't see. In fact, the first definition of light in the dictionary is something that allows vision. Light helps us to see, light helps us to make sense of our surroundings. Light keeps us from being blind. But what else does light do? Light directs us. Light makes a path. Light leads us. See, if if we're just surrounded by darkness, we don't know where to go. We don't know how to get to the next place. But when we shine a light, a light illuminates our path. It shows us where our feet are going. It shows us what's ahead and what to avoid. Light leads us. What else does light do? Light gives us security. You ever, you ever been somewhere that's really dark? Like you're outside, you're in a new city, and you walk through a, a darkened alleyway. Do you feel safe? No. I'm not just talking about children. I'm talking about all of us, grown adults. Can we admit that when it gets dark, we don't feel safe? Some of you, you were reaching for your purses when everything went dark. I know it's a church, but it's the perfect place for imperfect people. I don't know this heathen next to me. Bring my purse closer. It's not just little children. It's all of us. And we try to play it off because we're adults. Like if we're walking through something dark and we feel afraid, we, 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 like we just try to brush it off by singing a song. Life will all make sense when I am older. Whoa, what was that? Did you hear that noise? Samantha? Like, whoa, whoa. I'm not afraid of you. We, we shout things. You ever shouted something like that? Who's there? I have a light. I'm not afraid. I'm 38 years old. I'm not afraid of the dark. I read an interview with Stephen King uh, talking about his, his method of writing. And the interviewer asked him, do you write ever at nighttime? He says, of course not. Not with what I write. <laughs> this horror author only writes when there's light outside. Why? Because we understand light brings, uh, the darkness brings fear. So light gives us security. This is why we line our homes with night lights. This is why we have lights on timers around our cities and our communities, because it brings a sense of security. Why does it bring a sense of security? Because all the bad men, all the boogeymen, all the evil things, they have to go. What does light do? Light dispels darkness. Now, this is going to be really, really mind-blowing, so just hold on to your head right now, okay? You need to understand this, that darkness loses its darkness in the light. The place just got lit up. Darkness has to go. Darkness has to flee when there is light present. Darkness no longer exists 
because of the light. That's what light does. It dispels darkness. Light also cheers us up. Are you aware of that? A lot, of, a lot of what people are experiencing today in, in, in workplaces because they're indoors and they don't have natural light, they get depressed. In parts of the country, in parts of the world where the sun is hidden because of the weather, because of clouds, because of overcast, multiple times throughout the year, people in those regions, they suffer depression at a much higher rate than places like Florida or California. And so the... The, the, the treatment for what they're experiencing, which, by the way, is called SAD, this is a real thing. Seasonal affective disorder. They're not seeing the sun. They are sad. And the treatment for seasonal affective disorder is to put people in light rooms where they have, and they mimic uh, this light. It's artificial, but it feels like the sun. And what it does is, is it lowers the melatonin in our body and therefore cheers people up. That's what light does. Light cheers us up. Light warms us. It warms us up. We live in South Florida. Do I need to share a whole bunch about that? Of course not. I'm thankful for this weather right now. Amen. But inevitably, in two days, when the sun is out and, 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 and we are no longer cold and we are no longer uh, feelingless because of the cold weather, it's because we have the sun's light to warm us up, to think. Light, it warms us up. Light also purifies, and it cleans. Now, this is going to date a whole lot of people in here, and that's okay. Anyone know what this is? Anyone 21 or younger know what this is? Clothespin. Now, you know, unpopular to, to, to belief. This isn't just for arts and crafts. There was, many of you, you know what this is. You remember a time in history where after we cleaned our clothes, we would hang them out to dry on a line with a clothespin. The sun would warm the clothes and dry it, but why else would we hang up clothes to dry? Because the sun can clean. Do you know that the sun can actually bleach things? If you leave a garment out in the sun for a long time, what was added, what was stained onto the garment will be washed away. It cleans. Not only does light clean, but light purifies. In 1877, we understood that light can purify bacteria. Before we had Tide Pods and kids were popping them like Tic Tacs. Before we had all these artificial uh, 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 things to, to, to clean our, our, and to sanitize our equipment, the sun would do the job. Even today, UV light is used to kill and to purify things, to kill the bacteria. Light also heals us. Sunlight therapy is a real thing. And it does wonders for, for people with ailments like tuberculosis and pneumonia, mumps and fungal infections. Not only that, but, but little tiny flashes of infrared light. They work tremendously to bring hope and healing in, in certain ailments, to, to build up muscles, to reverse the worst effects of diabetes. Tiny flashes of light can even heal blindness. Light has the power to heal. Light also gives us life. We learned this in elementary school, that the sun is the source of all living things on planet Earth. That directly it affects all the living plants, and indirectly it affects all the living creatures. If we got rid of the sun... All the intelligent life here on earth, earth would cease to exist. Light is essential. It is critical for life. But not only that, light brings hope. Light brings hope. For, for, for ages, light has been a symbol of hope. When you're going through a dark season in your life, when you're going through a season of despair, maybe you've had someone say, don't worry, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You just keep on heading down that path. Can you see it? Even if it's a small little glimmer, there is hope that one day you will get through this darkness that you're going through. I get it. I understand that Christmas has its complexities. 
Some of us were burdened about the debt that we're going to incur trying to please everybody. Some of us are reminded of the loss that we've experienced in our family because now we're surrounded by all of this family and all this festivity and all we can think of is the hurt that we're experiencing. For many people in here, Christmas is not merry and bright. But I want to tell you, whatever season you're going through, we're setting the tone today. There is hope. Jesus can give you hope. The word in the beginning is here with us today. And I want you to hear his life-giving word to you. See, Jesus, the light of the world, helps us to see. Before Jesus, we were spiritually blind because of our sin and our rebellion We've been blinded. We don't see God for who he really is. We see religion and not relationship. But Jesus says in John 12, 46, he says, I have come as light into the world that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. See, now, now we can see. Now we know and we understand that we have been created by a God who loves us, not a God who's come to, to ruin our life, to, to stifle our, our fun and our enjoyment, but a God who loves us. And now we know and understand that it's our sin that has separated us from this loving God, but now because of Jesus, the light of the world, we now know and we understand that our relationship with God can be refreshed and renewed and we can be part of his family forever. We clearly see God for who he is, a loving father who welcomes us home. And Jesus, the light of the world, not only does he help us to see, but he also leads us. We weren't just spiritually blind, but we were also spiritually lost with no purpose, with no destination in life. But, but Jesus says in John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever follows the path that I've set, whoever follows in my footsteps, whoever follows the light that I am, will not be walking in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now we have purpose. Now we understand why we were created and why we exist to point other people to this light so people can understand the light of the world can set them free as well. This is why we sing songs like Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but, but now I'm found. Now I have direction. The light is leading me. I once was blind, but now I have healing. The, the hope of the world, the light of the world has set me free. And I want to encourage everyone. And I want everyone to know this love and life that I found in the light of the world. Jesus, the light of the world, gives security. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says, For Jesus has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm never going to leave you behind. I'm never going to give you up. I'm going to walk with you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Listen, when you have Jesus, you don't have to fear anything. You don't have to worry about what they said about you. They don't define you. They don't give you your purpose. They didn't create you. They didn't know what you've been designed for, but God does. And when God looks at you, he sees his precious, unique, one-of-a-kind, original masterpiece. He sees someone that he was willing to die for, someone that he was willing to wait for. We have direction now. We have hope. We have security. We don't have to fear anything. We don't even have to fear the spiritual. See, the, Jesus, the light of the world, he dispels darkness. Romans 8.38 says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, a.k.a. demons and demonic powers, nor things present, nor anything to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God found in Christ Jesus our Lord. He loves us. He's with us. He gives us security. We don't have to fear man. We don't have to fear the spiritual. Because James 4, 7 says, when you submit yourselves to God, when you resist the devil, when, when you say, Lord, I'm surrendered to your ways. I'm following your light. 
I'm doing what you've asked me to do. When we resist the devil and say, no, that's not what I've been created for. I'm going to resist your lies. That's not who I am. I'm, I'm not, not going to believe the identity you're saying that I have. I'm resisting the devil. I belong to Jesus. It says that he what? Come on, 10 o'clock. He what? He will. There's a promise. There's confidence. He will flee from you. You don't have to worry about the supernatural. The presence of God is with you. And you know what that does? Jesus, the light of the world, cheers us up. Some of you right now, you're like, why is this guy so happy? If you could just know what, what, what's in my past, if you could know the, the, the pain that my family has gone through over the past 12 months, I should not be this excited to share Jesus, but Jesus has cheered me up. Isaiah 60, verse 20, it says, Your son shall go down no more. This is a prophecy to the people of Israel talking about Jesus, Emmanuel, who will come, the light of the world. Your sun shall go down no more, nor your moon withdraw itself, meaning you're always going to have light. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. He gives peace that surpasses our understanding. It doesn't make sense. It shouldn't make sense. But the reason we experience hope and, and life and, and joy is because in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. He cheers us up. Jesus, the light of the world, also warms us up. Maybe because of what you've experienced, maybe because of the pain, the hurt that you've gone through. Your heart is cold. It's calloused. But Jesus can warm it up. Ezekiel eleven nineteen, God says, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put in them. And I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh, and they shall be my people, and I will be their gods. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying now there's a relationship. Some of us, our heart is cold. We, we've turned cold to other people, and God's saying, no, no I want to be in relationship with you. He's shown us all throughout his scripture that he is a father who loves us. He shows in the New Testament that he's a father waiting with arms wide open. And when we come home, he embraces us. And we feel the warmth of his embrace. We're a part of his family. We're his child. Jesus, the light of the world, cleans and purifies. First John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with God. We have relationship with God. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from what? All sin. Everything you've done. Everything that you try to keep in the dark. The things you are ashamed of. The secrets that you keep. He washes it all away. He takes away the guilt. He lifts up the burden. He cleans and he purifies. And now when God looks at us because Jesus, the light of the world, has come and we've received it for ourselves, God sees holy. God sees forgiven. He cleans and he purifies. Jesus, the light of the world, heals us. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus went to the temple, pulled out a scroll from Isaiah, and this effectively kick-started his public ministry. He said, the spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, set me apart, lifted me up to bring good news to the afflicted. Not bad news. Not news of condemnation. Not news of judgment, but good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Some of you, you may be wounded. You may be hurt by the words and the actions of people around you, by the world around you. Jesus is your healer. Some of you, because of the foolishness of your decision, you're now experiencing the repercussions and the consequences of that. And maybe it's physical. Maybe it's some ailment in your body. Jesus is the healer. For all these things and more, Jesus heals. The light of the world has come to bring healing. Jesus, the light of the world, brings life. Isaiah 9-2, it says, the people who are sitting in darkness, they saw great light to those who are sitting in the land and shadow of death. That's who we were before we met Jesus. It says, upon them a light dawned. Romans 6, 23. 
It says that the wages of sin is death. We're eternally separated. We deserve hell. We are blinded to the things of God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. He's come to bring life. And ultimately, Jesus, the light of the world, brings hope. He brings hope. For so many of us, death, it feels like something that's darkened our perspective. Death is something that we dread. But Jesus wants to bring hope. Jesus wants us to know that death isn't final. That death is just a beginning of new life. John 11, verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the rebirth. And I am the life. And he who believes in me shall live even if he dies. All those that we have lost up into this point who've trusted in the light of the world, it's not over for them. We're going to see and we're going to celebrate with them an eternity in the presence of God forever. Even if they die, in Jesus they live. And, and everyone who lives, everyone who still has breath but believes in Jesus, he says, shall never die. And then he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? This is who Jesus is. He's not some fragile little baby. He's not some defeated hero on a cross. He's God. He's creator. And he's come to bring life. And he's come to bring hope. And this is the tone we're setting for this Christmas. God can do and will do the impossible if we surrender. So here's what I want us to do as we conclude today. Just close your eyes all across this room. Close your eyes and Chances are you're seeing darkness right now. And just with your eyes closed in this presence of darkness, you don't see light. I want you to think of where you need the light of the world to shine into your life. Whether that's to, to, to cause you not to be blinded by the things and the poor decisions you've made. Whether that's to, to light your path and the next step you should take whether that's to give you a sense of security or belonging, a sense of healing, a sense of family. Do you need Jesus, the light of the world, to, to free you and to dispel all the darkness that you're experiencing? Do you need Jesus, the light of the world, to, to bring you life and to bring you hope today? Where, wherever you need that light, can I tell you, Jesus is the answer. He's what your soul has been longing for. And the great thing about Jesus and the life and the light that he comes to bring is we can receive it simply by accepting it. So if you're here today and you know Jesus and you've been walking with Jesus, but you need his light, you need his light to shine brightly on an area of your life, he's here. He's with you. He's not defeated. He's not powerless. Just receive his hope for your life right now receive his healing, receive his direction. But I want to talk right now. We're setting the tone for what God can do. I want to talk right now for those of you who don't have this light. For those of you who feel like you've been walking around in darkness. For those of you who feel like you've tried religion but it hasn't worked and you need something real. You need Jesus. You need the light of the world to set you free. If that's you, all you have to do is receive. And so here's what I want us to do. In a posture of surrender, in a posture of receiving, if that is you, if you need new life today, I'm gonna to count down from three to one. And when I say one, I want you in a posture of receiving, just to stretch up your hands and say, I receive Jesus, the light of the world, and your life and your eternity will forever be transformed. Three, he loves you. He's been searching for you. He's found you here in this place. Two, he can do the impossible. He can make all things new. And if you need a new life and a new beginning, one, shoot up your hand across this room. Shoot up your hand and say, I surrender. I receive you, Jesus. I receive your life across this room. I see you right now. He's your hope. He's your life. This is a new beginning for you, church. You can put your hands down. I want to pray for you right now. Father, thank you. Thank you for those 
today who have received your light, for those who have been walking with you, but now they see things more clearly. But Lord, I want to specifically thank you for those who have trusted in you for the first time. God, you are not distant. You are present. You are very help in our time of trouble, and you are here right now, Lord. And so, Father, I just pray that they would walk with you, that they would experience freedom, that they would be transformed from the inside out, that like you've done to all of us, you'd give them new desires and a new purpose, that they would understand that their past is erased, their sins are forgiven, and what's ahead of them is a relationship with you, walking with you, you never leaving them, you guiding them, you guiding their steps, you giving them warmth, you giving them hope, you giving them new life today. Thank you so much, Lord. We celebrate you. Come on, church, and celebrate them right now. We celebrate you for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you will continue to do as we seek you, the light of the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said,